Today we're going to be talking about some reactions to relativism, as I phrase it here, uh, in the poetry of Yeats and also in the philosophy of Unamuno. Uh, these are, I think, two very interesting figures that it's somewhat odd to put together. They would, at first glance, look as if they have much to do with each other. But actually, I think they give us very interesting responses to the intellectual crises that we've been talking about and that they perceive as going on in the early 20th century. Let's start by talking about William Butler Yeats. As you can see, he was born in 1865. He was an Irish po poet and playwright. He was active in the independence movement for Ireland, which finally bore fruit. And in 1922, he was elected to the newly formed Irish Senate, where he served two terms. In 1923, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, it's not many people who have managed to win Nobel Prizes for Literature at the same time as serving as a government official in the way that he did. Um, he also symbolized Ireland, in a way, in literature as well as in politics. Um, he was a sort of dramatic figure, as you can see from the image, um, and his poetry is dramatic. It's based on a sort of theory of history. I say sort of a theory because it's not exactly very well worked out, but an image, you might almost say, of the way history develops. And so what we're going to do today is look at a couple of his most famous poems, but also think about the underlying image of civilization. Uh, that he presents them. Now, there are a number of themes I want you to watch out for as we go along. Uh, this, by the way, in the background is a bridge that is uh, undergoing, <laughs> uh, well, harmonic motion is about to collapse. It's one of the most famous bridge collapses in history. Anyway, that's how he sees civilization. He sees civilization as weary, as weak, as beginning to collapse. Of course, he's saying this right in, in well, it's the aftermath of the First World War, so he's seeing it at a different stage from our perspective, but nevertheless, he sees civilization as beginning to crack, as not quite in these stages of real collapse, but nevertheless as swaying and beginning to crumble. Now, his main concern really isn't that. After all, Eliot sees himself as sort of picking up the fragments, picking up the pieces, and trying to put civilization back together again. That's not Yeats's view. He thinks that nature abhors a vacuum, and that civilization is about to collapse. It's going to be replaced by something. But what? What is it that's going to replace the civilization that's crumbling, that is about to collapse? Well, he's not sure. He doesn't think it's going to be good. And as you'll see, there are all sorts of images of foreboding in the poems, indicating that he thinks something very bad is about to happen. Something is going to move into the space that is vacated by civilization, what is it going to be? There's a nostalgia for an earlier era, an attempt to reach beyond the limits of time and the cycles of history to find something abiding, something enduring, something eternal. Um, and so going along with this nostalgia for an earlier era is a desire for something that transcends the bounds of history. Here is one of his most famous poems called The Second Coming. It's one of the most famous poems of the 20th century. It is, as an autobiographical note, the poem I read to my children on the night of September 11, 2001. It was written in 1920, just after the First World War. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Now before we go on, I want to examine that initial image. I've tried to suggest it here. Turning and turning, turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. What's going on? Yeah. Well, um, actually, I have a question. Um, is that where the book title "Things Fall Apart" comes from? This this poem. Which book title? Uh, Things fall apart by some African writer. There are a number of book titles that come from this poem. Yeah, "Things Fall Apart" is one. Um, the center cannot hold. That's a famous uh, phrase. We're going to see others as the poem goes on. Um, <laughs> There's a phrase in here, slouching toward Bethlehem. That's been used as a title. Um, Robert Fork wrote a book on American law entitled Slouching Toward Gomorrah. Uh, um, so yes, many, many figures have uh, referenced this poem and have taken phrases, because there are lots of great phrases. This is a cynical view, but sometimes I think the poet's job is to just give you really powerful, really memorable phrases. And you know the, whatever the rest of the poem says is fine. You can appreciate that, but what you'll remember are these few really important, really central phrases. And this poem is remarkable because there's just a bunch of them. Things fall apart. I mean, that's a very powerful one, right? 
everything crumbles. The center cannot hold. That's something that all sorts of people have used as a metaphor for a variety of political situations and other kinds of situations. Um, the ceremony of innocence. That's an awesome phrase. Um, and so, and actually many people remember these last two lines. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. We'll see some others as the poem goes on. So he really does have a remarkable flair for language and for the phrase that is highly memorable. And this one, there are so many that it almost feels like, oh gosh, he just took about some famous phrases and stuck them together. <laughs> well, they weren't famous until this poem came along. Uh, now, okay, so initially, turning and turning, we're going to talk about the gyre in a moment. This is one of his main images. This is his main metaphor for history. But now, it's, a, it's basically a circle, a circle that keeps getting wider and wider, okay? The falcon cannot hear the falcon, and so its circles get wider and wider, it gets further and further away. Things fall apart, the center cannot hear. What is his worry? Yeah? Without a civilization to hold everything to the center and bring everything back, um, that everything will just collapse, you know, everything will just fall apart. Ah, good, good, yes, there's a great thing to think about, actually, you probably studied this sort of thing in physics with angular motion. Imagine ha having some weight on a string and you start swinging it around like this, right? What happens if you let go? It goes flying off, right, <laughs> in a straight line. Now, it takes quite a bit of force, and the more weight you have on the string, and the faster you swing it, the more effort you have to expend, right? The more force you have to exert to keep it from flying off. Well, one way of looking at this is, look, there's no, nothing actually binding the falcon to the falconer. It's only the, the sort of moral power of the falconer, right, that keeps the falcon returning. Well, it's getting further and further away. It's swinging wider and wider. The ability of anybody to control things is getting weaker and weaker. And indeed, it turns out, <laughs> yeah, things are falling apart. Nobody's able to exert that force. You might say, here's one of the things that he's really worried about. In history, there are all sorts of forces that break a society apart, that smash a civilization. And it takes real effort to hold things together. You stop exerting the effort, even you exert less effort, and things start spinning out of control. So he sees that thing happening. Things are spinning out of control. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. What does he have in mind here? What blood dim time? War? War, yeah, this is just after the First World War, right? And so indeed, it can look like we've seen mere anarchy loosed upon the world. Now actually, <laughs> would that it were anarchy. It was the most powerful governments in the world sending their people into each other's killing machines. And so it was far worse than mere anarchy. This, there was nothing random about the killing of the First World War. But nevertheless, it would look that way, right? Nothing makes any sense. This doesn't seem to have any structure. There's widespread killing. A blood-dimmed tie is loose. And remember the Larkin poem, Never Such Innocence Again. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. There's this sense that before the war, people were innocent. People took things at face value. They believed in things. But now, after the war, all of that's gone. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. There isn't any longer any ability to face things and believe in things and hold things together in the way there was before. Yeah. What object or concept is he referencing when he says ceremony? Yeah, what does he mean, the ceremony of innocence? That, that, that bothers me. Yeah, good child, question. I think it's their childhood. Like, it's a, as your childhood is like, is like a ceremony of you growing out of your innocence. But that ceremony is down because everything gets thrown at you at once, and you don't have one a time to digest it. Okay, good. One thing we can interpret here is the ceremony of innocence, childhood, and the rituals of childhood. Okay? There are a number of things that I think all of these phrases really mean, and so there are a number of associations you might have here. And one of them, one that many people have, is childhood, ceremonies of innocence. Um, recalls a time back when things were simpler, right? Life was simpler. There were certain rituals that children go through, like what? I mean, what are some ceremonies of innocence? Sort of childhood rituals. Um, running to the Christmas tree to find Santa's presents. Running to the Christmas tree to find presents. Okay, that's a good example. Other ones. Birthday. Birthday celebrations. Yeah, what else? The tooth fairy. The tooth fairy. Good. Yeah, 
Yeah. All right, good. I, you don't have to read them all. Sorry. No responsibilities. There, yeah, there aren't many responsibilities you have as a child. You don't have to make your own living. Uh, there's a sense in which, well, those aren't specific ceremonies. There is a kind of innocence to all of that. And really, I think everybody's childhood has certain of these ceremonies, certain things you do, certain family rituals. That's part of what family life is. What your rituals were is probably different from what mine were um, or my kids were. There are just things that were part of your family. You know, when I was growing up, there was a stage where Saturday night, we had pizza. And it was like Saturday night was pizza night. That was one of the ceremonies of innocence. There was another stage where there was this great milkshake shop nearby, and Friday night was milkshake night. As you can see, my parents were not into health foods. <laughs> um, but there, was, there were certain ceremonies like that, certain things you did, typically. Yeah? I think it's, it's like translating over just to a broader, um, just sense of Oh, good. Dependability. Yeah. The idea of ceremonies, of rituals, of, of predictable patterns. Yeah, in a sense, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The predictable patterns are gone. Nobody quite knows how to live now or what to do now. There were certain established rituals, and they're comfortable, right? Why do people develop those kinds of rituals? Partly because they're sources of comfort. You know how to, what to predict. You know sort of how things are to go. When all of a sudden you have no idea, that's difficult. That's hard to deal with. In fact, one of the things that I think makes going to college hard is that all of a sudden you're away from those standard rituals and you have to make up new ones of your own. And that's a challenging thing to do. That's an uncomfortable thing. And so this is kind of foreshadowing the void, right? Like if, this, if these ceremonies which have held us together are so far are being drowned and are being destroyed, then they're being filled with something else. Good. The, yes, this idea of a void, a vacuum that's going to have to be filled, if these rituals are being thrown out, if they're no longer there, there's a vacuum that has to be filled. Okay? We have a need for some predictability, for some rit ritual, some, for some ceremony, something that will hold life together. And if those are gone, we need new ones. Now, there's something else that ceremonies of innocence might suggest to you. Any other? Yeah. Religion. Religion. Good. Ceremony. Right? That's a kind of... Formal, I mean, it doesn't have to be religious, but a religious ceremony is something that naturally comes to mind. Um, what are some examples of religious ceremonies? Baptism. Okay, mass, baptism, weddings, other, you know, funerals, good. Yeah, there are all sorts of things like that, right? And so we might think about ceremonies in that religious sense. And it might be social things like weddings, funerals, and so on. It might be individual things like confession or baptism. But those things, in fact, notice the image here, of drowned. It's sort of, if you think baptism at all, it's pretty disturbing, right? I mean, they dip you under the water, and in this case, they don't let you up again. Um, but there's something disturbing about all of this. It's like, yeah, those ceremonies we relied on to mark important guideposts in life, to structure things to get the meaning for God. So the best lack all conviction, well, the worst are full of passionate intensity. What does he have in mind there? Yeah. The ones that are content with the status quo aren't going to be trying to like, achieve it. While the ones that are worse than that, they're, they went, they're very upset with how things are, they're going to be full of passion and intensity. They don't want to change things. Ah, okay, right. Who are the best here? Would it be, would it be the ones that the well, we could try tying it to the war. Who do you have in mind? I mean, you couldn't say, oh, the best, the guy's on our side, <laughs> the worst, the guy's on their side. It could be that kind of thing. But here's another way of reading it, right? Or your way is to say, well, by the best, I mean those who have a lot of commitment in the status quo, who are already really heavily involved and highly placed and so on. It could mean all of that. But here's another way of taking it. The best, those who are most dedicated, those who are the agents who have been responsible for holding things together at the center and holding civilization together, they're the ones that have lost faith. They're the ones that have lost conviction. Okay, the guy there swinging the thing around, exerting the force, he's getting tired. <laughs> okay, and he's thinking, what's the point of this anyway? Why should I bother? I don't think there's any real reason to do this. And so the people who are making it all hang together, they're the ones who are losing faith. They're losing all conviction. While the people who don't have any stake in it, the ones who are eager to destroy civilization, they sense the weakness. And they're full of passionate intensity. So, this image of the gyre, what is he thinking about here? Well, here's a little image of these two spirals intersecting in this way. 
He's thinking that history goes in a kind of cyclical fashion, but in a more complicated way than you might think. And these are long-term things. This isn't a sort of 10 or 20 year pendulum swing or something like that. We're talking about 2,000 year historical cycles. And he is convinced that with the dawn of the 20th century, one of those historical cycles is coming to an end. There's been a strong historical cycle lasting for about 2,000 years. We're down here. <laughs> Okay, it's dwindling, something else is growing and taking its place. But what is it? It's still weak enough that it's hard to discern what it really is. This has them overlapping so much, it's easy to sort of miss the point that once you get to about this stage, this thing is growing, but it's hard to identify. This thing is declining. It's easy to identify it, it's been around for a long time, but he sees that gap is opening up. Now, Think back, what is 2,000 years before Yates? <laughs> um, Judaism, like heavy, heavy religion, heavy... Well, okay, good. Christianity, right? I mean, this red part, you might think, this is Christianity. It gets its birth about 2,000 years before, and he thinks it's now dwindling in its cultural influence. So what's going to replace it? By the way, what was there beforehand? What did Christianity replace? The period roughly 2000 BC to zero, what would you characterize that as? Uh, the uh, Neolithic Revolution. Well, okay, you've got, yeah, you've got a lot of things going on. The Stone Age and the Brown, this is being succeeded by the Bronze Age and then Iron Age and so on. You've got all of that. What was happening around 2000 years? Polytheism. Like, I mean, all the cultures oh. were worshipped. You know, they had their different gods. And you had like Greeks and you had Romans and all that stuff. Going on. Okay, yeah, was... lots of different gods. You got Greeks, you got Romans. <laughs> yeah, <it's very> good. <laughs> you, know. you got all right. Yes, I mean, think about 2000 BC. What's happening then? You've got pyramids under construction, right? In Egypt, you've got the height of Egyptian civilization, something that would continue being strong for the next thousand years. There's still a thousand years before Homer. But you might say the end, the beginning of what we think of as the classical um, era really start then. You've got the beginnings, well, well not just the beginnings, the height of civilization in the Middle East, in Egypt. You have um, the beginnings of civilization in India. You've got all sorts of things that later end up giving you classical Greece. And then that's succeeded by the Roman Empire and then Christianity and its rise. Well, we're thinking in terms of broad arrows like that. Before, say, 2000, what was there? We really have only fragments. The earliest writing we have is from about 3000 BC. And what is it? Does anybody know what the earliest bit of writing is? Okay. Oh, it's an accounting book. It's actually somebody keeping accounts of, I think, shipments of beer. Uh, in any case, <laughs> It's not clear what it's really shipments of. I like to think of the shipments of beer. But anyway, we have an account ledger from about 3000 BC, but then that's it, you know? We don't really have much writing. So you might think, all right, civilization in a way arises, and we get that kind of classical civilization going, and then we get the rise of Christianity, and now we get what? What is the next 2,000 years going to bring? And he's not sure. He doesn't have a good feeling about it. So the poem continues. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi, the spirit of the world, okay, troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with a lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert. Well, I've got here pictured what I think is the image he has in his head, the Sphinx. Now, the Sphinx, something you might take as the symbol of the beginnings of Egyptian civilization. And so the beginnings of that pre-Christian era that he's thinking of, well, something like that, right? It's something like the beginnings of a new era, the way the Sphinx might be thought of as the beginnings of that classical era, or in the way that the birth of Christ could be viewed as the beginning of the next era. We've got this other era coming. <laughs> but now, what is it going to be? It's going to be something analogous, maybe, to that. Um, 
Yeah. What can we infer from this image? He's going back and reminding us of that image of the beginnings of Egyptian civilization. But there's something else. Let's look at the detail, right? Of the world spirit. Okay, so the way that things move in the world is developing. Now, by the way, Hegel had this idea that history progresses. The world spirit progresses to a greater and greater state of self-knowledge. This is not the image of progress. <laughs> okay? This is more like an accordion. This isn't just things get better and better and better. No, this is more like things develop they collapse. They develop, they collapse. This is not one that suggests that overall things get better and better. Now, what can we infer about it at all? Well, in the sands of the desert. Anything we can infer from that? Just think desert. What does that symbolize? Kind of nothingness. Coming out of nowhere, in other words, is this thing. Okay, a shape with a lion body and the head of a man. Lion body, what does that suggest to you? Power, courage. Power. Good, power, courage, violence, right? The head of a man, how about that? What does that suggest? Intelligence. Several people spoke at once, what? Intelligence. Okay, good, intelligence, thought, rationality. So it's going to be strong, it's going to be powerful, and maybe quite violent. It's nevertheless going to have some degree of rationality. We're not talking about a sudden collapse of all intelligence. A gaze blank and similar to the sun. What about that? Merciless. Merciless. Yeah, it's not going to have our values, okay? Our values are part of that declining era. Our values are the ones that have been developed over that previous 2,000 year period. They're going to be replaced by something else. From our point of view, it's going to look like it doesn't have any values at all. And so it's going to be pitiless toward us. It's moving its slow thighs, about it reel the shadows of the desert birds. And now, the darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking crate. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem's evil. Okay, I actually don't want to say anything about it. I just want you to. <laughs> Reactions. Yeah. Um, I used to do a little bit of reading about uh, how there was a lot of predictions between the Mayan calendar as well, but also between astrology, how the different the Pis era of Pisces and we're going to the age of Aquarius, and at that same idea of like this is the end of the time of Jesus and this is a new time. You know, two thousands were lead to the age of Aquarius, which will be a new prophet, a new state of being. Ah, okay, yeah, there are a variety of different views of this. Actually, in my childhood, the age of Aquarius was, was, was supposed to be the cool time, right? I mean, I wasn't really part of that 60s generation. They were like, I don't know, they were, I was a kid when people were in college doing those things. But nevertheless, <laughs> I remember the music. The age of Aquarius, Aquarius, right? <laughs> now, yeah, okay. Well, is it going to be wonderful? Is it going to be great? Everybody just, you know, take off their clothes and let their hair grow long and lie about in the sun? There was this sort of Rousseau, noble, savage image of, oh, yes, just wonderful. But that's not his view, right? Civilization collapses. Does that mean we go back to noble savagery? We just lie around the banks of the stream? We dine on the fruit that happens to fall at our feet from the trees? We lean over and take sips of you know, cool, pure water from the brook? Is that what it's going to be like? No, his image is, look, the darkness drops again. 20 centuries of stony sea were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. In other words, there are these dark and powerful forces. Go back to the gyre. It's sort of like, what's out here? What's sort of impinging when things get weak and start crumbling? It's not just beauty and inner niceness and purity and love and so on. No, it's something terrifying. It's something destructive. And so what happens in these in these eras, you might say, is that when any view is strong, whether it's the classical era or the Christian era or whatever it is, then it keeps the darkness at bay. It rocks it to sleep. But what happens when things get weak? Well, notice that darkness closes in. And so the age, the, the sort of transition from one age to another, is a very difficult, very dangerous, very bloody thing. And that's what frightens him. He's looking at this and he's saying, yeah, whatever the era is, good, bad, or whatever, when something is powerful, when it's dominant, it at least keeps the peace. But 
What happens when it starts weakening? Rough beats. <laughs> Their hour comes around at last. We're talking about destruction. We're talking about merciless savagery. That's what is going to be born. Will it eventually emerge into something that is better than that, that keeps the darkness at bay? Well, one can hope. <laughs> but that period of transition is likely to be violent and difficult. Let's look at a poem he wrote somewhat later, as part of a book called The Tower. This, <laughs> this was written when he was actually not so much older than I am, but nevertheless felt himself an old man. Okay, sailing to Byzantium. Before we go into the poem, what is Byzantium? Okay, so yeah, he's talking about a lost empire, right? the Byzantine Empire. Byzantium, the capital city of that empire. What is it today? Istanbul. Good, Istanbul, right? So it goes from Byzant Byzantium is sort of this era, you might say, in the history of that part of Turkey, the sort of meeting place of Europe and Asia. And he's thinking about the basically the lost glories of an empire. Now, let's see how he describes it. That is no country for old men. Talk about more famous titles drawn from the world, right? The young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. What's the image initially? It's changing. It doesn't seem that bad. Everybody in their other's arms. If you just look at those two lines, maybe it could be love or something. Right. Yeah, actually, this part, this isn't so terrible. Before, he's concerned with the darkness closing in, right? Now it's more like... Yeah, I'm an old guy, and I look around, and hear all these young people, uh, and they're in one another's arms, they're enjoying life, they're young, and everything's there, you know, the future is ahead of them, the birds are in the trees, they're singing, I'm a dying generation, they're the generation that's succeeding, and so, you know, I'm listening to their song. This is no country for old men like me, he's thinking, this is a country for the young. And now, we get another image of this, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, Fish, flesh, or fowl, come in all summer long, whatever is begotten, born. Okay, tell me about salmon. What do they do? They go back to where they were born. That's right, they're born upstream, they go down to the sea, and then they swim back up, they mate, and they die. Okay. How about mackerel? I don't know what they used Yeah, mackerel aren't so famous. Uh, one female mackerel can lay actually millions of eggs. And so, when they are born, you just get mackerel everywhere. You get these swarms of fish just all over the place, okay? So, in part, here we've got symbols of fertility, but all summer long, well, great, you know, they, they are born, they're fertile. We got these images of love, of reproduction, of fertility, all summer long. But then he reminds us, whatever is begotten, born, dies. So, there's a way of now starting to play music from The Lion King, The Circle of Life, blah, 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 all of that sort of thing. He feels like, yeah, it's The Circle of Life. I'm on the downside, but lots of people here are on the upside, fine. Con that sensual music all neglect monuments of an aging intellect. Now, here is where he's trying to get us out of that simple Circle of Life idea. People are born. They grow, they live their summers. Then they start declining. They eventually die. What survives? Anything? Ideas. Ah, oh, yes, maybe these monuments of unaging it. Okay? Unlike the Sam, unlike the Mac, <coughs> we can leave behind monuments. And so he's getting interested in these monuments, these things that do not go through the same cycle, that do not die, but can actually persist. Is there anything like it? He says, an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick. <laughs> Yeah, a tattered coat on a stick. That's it. Unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. What on earth is he talking about? You're too young to get it. Yeah, even I think I'm a little too young to get it. But what he's saying is, look, once you get old, <laughs> you realize your body is a paltry thing. The mind is still there, okay? The mind is there, but
But now you've got a tattered coat of hummus stick. I mean, you've got this weakened body. And so the body dies, and he's interested in whether anything else can live, outlive the body. Anything else can live longer than that. He's longing for immortality, for eternity. And so he says, yeah, this mortal dress is falling apart. In other words, the body is falling apart. And I'd like to learn how to get the soul to clap its hands and sing anyway. I'd like to let the thing that is still surviving still alive inside. I want to let that out and let it live. But how do I do that? Well, there's no singing school. It was a very popular thing in the 19th century and early part of the 20th century to have these singing schools. People went around and taught people how to sing. They taught them music. They taught them do, re, mi. And in fact, there are all these shape book um, hymnals often, but not always just religious things, where you didn't have to actually know how to read the music. It was written on lines and staffs and so on, but also all of the do always had the same shape. So some of these were triangles, some of them were squares, some of them were ovals. And you could just sing by that. You just knew Do was a. Actually, what is Do in this? Do is the square. I think Do is the circle. Do is the square. Yeah, so is the square. And yeah. And so you just learn, oh, that shape, that means me. That shape, that's Fa. And so on. And so you would do this sort of thing. He said, yeah, but unfortunately for souls, there isn't anything like that. Um, all we can do is study the monuments that other people have left behind. Monuments of its own magnificence, monuments of the soul. And so therefore, he says, I've sailed the seas and I've come to the holy city of Byzantium. I've come back to what I perceive as this lost empire, looking for the things that are eternal. O sages standing in God's holy spot, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, Byzantine wall picture here, come from the holy fire, pern in a gyre, uh, the gyre. That pern here means real, spindle, spool. So again, a re reference to that sort of spiraling image. And be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away. These sages, right? Sages standing in God's holy fire. He's talking about the people at the height of the previous gyre, at the widest point. And he's saying, look, speak to me. You left things in gold. What makes gold special? Why is gold so valuable? People, people find it valuable. I mean, really, that's what it comes Well, people do find it valuable. We could be subjectivists about it. But are there real qualities of gold? It is rare. Good. It's rare. It's what shiny. Else? It's shiny. <laughs> it lasts for a long time. It's pliable. It, good. It's, it's incorruptible. It lasts for a long time. Okay? So gold persists. Gold doesn't rust. Gold doesn't fade away in the way that lots of other things do. It doesn't break down. It's highly stable. And so it persists. So the closest thing you can find to eternity in this life are these monuments. It's gold in a material sense. So that's what he's looking for. He's saying, oh, previous masters who left these monuments, you be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fastened to a dying animal. The dying animal is that body again. Okay, he's saying, really, each of us is fastened to a dying animal. Your animals are young. Okay, mine is kind of past its prime. <laughs> he's at a stage where he feels like, yeah, his animal is dying. But now, he wants to survive nevertheless. He wants some part of him to live. Well, it knows not what it is. That's the problem. What's left beyond the body? What's left besides the dying animal? He's not sure. But he wants to be gathered into the artifice of history. So, there's just an example of one of these golden mosaics from the Byzantine Empire. So it concludes, once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. But such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling. Again, gold, 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 something eternal, something that lasts. To keep a drowsy emperor awake, there was a story that the Byzantine emperor had people make him all these gold things to try to keep him awake. It was, I mean, they didn't have no dos or good sources of caffeine, so what did he want? He wanted things that would keep him awake, these golden things, and in particular, a golden bird that would sit on a golden bough. Okay, or sat upon gold and vowed to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past, is passing, or to come. So he's looking for this eternal spot, this lasting spot, from which he can view the past, the present, the future. But where is that? What could a, such a place be like? This is a painting called The Golden Bow, and there was a famous book of that title that also inspired Eliot.
that talked about the Fisher King and all of that. So there's a reference here, really, to that bit of mythology. Um, he's saying, I'd like something like that. I want something that is a source for a new mythology, something that can last, something that can actually keep <laughs> the emperor awake, that can keep my, my soul alive, even without a body. So I'm looking for another body. I want to be able to get by without the body. And I want somehow to be able to survive in this sense. Well, let's turn from Yates to the other figure I wanted to talk about today, Miguel de Unamuno. He was rector at the University of Salamanca in Spain for two periods, for 24 years at the beginning of the 20th century, and then again from 1930 to 1936. For six years, he was thrown out um, because of his political views. He got into big trouble. And when he came back, he began his first lecture by saying, as we were saying yesterday, <laughs> in which he echoed Fra Luis Ponce de Leon uh, from the 16th century, who similarly lost his position um, for about the same length of time because of the Spanish Inquisition. And when Ponce de Leon came back, he addressed his students as well by saying, as we were saying yesterday. So this is a nice bit of deja vu as well as a sort of joke about having been away. Um, Unamuno is... I think a remarkably, a remarkable figure in a number of ways. Um, he is not only a really good philosopher, he is a very good writer, a very powerful writer. Um, he is somebody who also is maybe the embodiment of Aristotle's idea of a great souled man. Somebody who is capable of undergoing that kind of persecution, coming back and just beginning with, in effect, a joke. But a joke with all sorts of historical echoes. Um, to indicate a certain attitude about his own suffering and his own position. It would be a difficult thing to do, I think, to come back and just sort of act as if no big deal, <laughs> right? Let's forget the interruption. Let's just get on with it. This is a monument um, to Ponce de Salamanca. Anyway, he writes of the tragic sense of life. <coughs> and here is a sort of motto for the work. I am a man. No other man do I deem a stranger. Now, I think that itself is a very powerful statement. And it, too, is a historical echo. Before we look at the echo part, though, tell me about what that means. I am a man. No other man do I deem a stranger. Good. We all have something vital in common, right? Now, he's writing this, again, shortly after the First World War. Divisions, sharp divisions between Englishmen and German, between Frenchmen, and Russian, and Serbian, and Austrian, and so on. And he's saying, look, forget the divisions. Forget all of that. It's a big movement of Wilson's at the end of the war is self-determination. Each ethnic group should get its own country. He's saying, forget that. Don't think of yourself as a Frenchman, or a Spaniard, or an Italian, or an Austrian, or a Serb. Think of yourself as a human being. I'm a human being. No other human being is alien to me. Nobody else is a stranger. And indeed, he is echoing here a statement from Terence, the ancient writer. Almost so, Mani nihil ame puto. Okay, which means I am a human being. I consider nothing human alien to me. Okay? It's a very powerful and very famous quote um, that Renaissance humanists especially seized upon as the foundation for their humanism. In Terence, well, he's, a, he's a Roman playwright uh, from North Africa, but also he writes comedies. And so in the context, I can't resist telling you about this, there are these two characters, basically one of them, Kremis, who is just a busybody, who concerns himself with everybody else's affairs. And basically he's, telling, he's saying what he's worried about. I'm worried about, and in effect he's saying things like the price of tea in China. Okay, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. I don't know how much the farmer's going to be planting this year, and what crops they'll decide to plant, and what prices they'll sell for, and what about this, and what about that, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And Menedemus says, why do you care so much about these things that don't concern you? Krema says, well, I'm a human being. I consider nothing human alien to me. I consider it either to warn me or to provide an example. And so it's really a busybody buddy who's kind of a comic figure who's saying, well, of course, I worry about everything because everything human is relevant to me. So it's kind of a joke in the play, but nevertheless reflecting a deeper truth. And so it's become famous because of that deeper truth that reflects. 
Now, for a moment, I want you to think about what's different here. I'm a human being. I consider nothing human, human alien to me. I am a man. No other man do I deem a stranger. What difference is there? There's a subtle difference, I think, between those two statements. Yeah? Ah, okay, one is between human being and man. But at the time that he's writing this, um, in saying I'm a man, I mean, he means the same thing, right? Uh, at a certain stage, people get worried about that and say, oh, he's excluding women and so on. But he certainly didn't mean to exclude women. <laughs> the idea was just you can use man in a context where it means, you know, uh, human, and it just makes it easier to write. So I don't think he meant to do that, although it's easy for people now to read it that way. I do not think he's saying, I'm a man, not some weak woman, and no other man do I need a stranger. You women, I don't know about you, but you guys, we can, you know, no, it's not that at all, right? He really means, I think, to be saying, I'm a human being, no other human being do I deem a stranger. But there's another difference that I think matters. Yeah? Um, Luna Munoz, uh, he's speaking a lot on a more personal level. Um, Karen's just saying, anything that is human-related, I understand. Luna Munoz is saying, no, personally, any man I encounter, I know him. Good, good. There's a difference between something that is human and a human being, right? <laughs> Terence is in effect saying, look, anything relevant to humanity is something I care about. But that might, that does include actually what crops are being planted and how much they're going to sell for and blah, 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 blah. Whereas he's not saying everything any human being cares about. He's talking about other human beings. He's talking about personal relationships. <coughs> not just anything you care about is something not, that is, you know, not strange to me, but rather you're not a stranger to me. You are somebody who I think I have an un underlying link with, a brotherhood with. And so it's really meant to be a human-to-human -human thing here. There's a difference there, I think, that really does make a difference. He's not just saying, I care about everything relevant to humanity. He's saying, I care about other human beings. I don't count you as strange. Now, he says, here's what concerns me. The man, and again, he's going to talk about man throughout this, but read human being. He does not mean this to be exclusive. The man of flesh and bone, the man who is born, suffers and dies, above all, who dies. The man who eats and drinks and plays and sleeps and thinks and wills. The man who is seen and heard, the brother, the real brother. What he's saying here is, look, I am concerned with human beings, but real human beings, real human beings, people who are born, who suffer, who die, who eat, drink, play, sleep, think, will, stay in relationships with other people. Suppose I say to you, who are you? We're being introduced, let's say. And so I'm saying, well, Hey, I'm Dan Bonovac, who are you? Nice to meet you. And now you're going to tell me a little bit about yourself. What are you going to say? The things you like doing. Good, things you like doing. Where are you from, maybe? Achievements. Achievements, what you've done. Who, who some of your friends are, who family members are, maybe? Right, to find some common connection. Okay, so things like that. What do you spend your days thinking about? I don't want to know. <laughs> now that I reflect, let's get that question. Um, yeah. Um, he says, look, there's another thing which is called man. That's why it's worth stressing this. He says, people have all sorts of theories of what human beings are. And that's what he's really concerned with. He says, yeah, there are all sorts of lucubrations, more or less scientific. Man, here is the legendary Federalist Biden of Plato. The zone political, political animal, Aristotle. The social contractor of Rousseau. The homo economicus, the economic man. The Manchester School of Economics. The homo sapiens of Linnaeus, the biologist. Or if you like, the vertical metal. So he's saying, look at theorists who describe human beings. What do they say? Oh, we're federalist finance, or we're political animals, or we enter into the social contract, or we try to maximize utility, or we are biological creatures of a certain kind. All of them are reducing human beings to something else that their theories have some simple account. And he says, that's where we're going wrong. If we ask what is essential to humanity, don't say, oh, we're rational animals, or we're featherless bipeds, or we produce uh, and we're capable of affecting the means of production, or you know, we are rational maximizers of something or other, or whatever it is. He says, don't give that account. We are people who are born, who <coughs> suffer, who die, who think, and will, and eat, and sleep, and dream. He says, all of those theories are theories of people who are neither here nor there. 
neither of this age nor another, and of neither sex nor country, who is in brief merely an idea, that is to say, a no man. So he's saying, look, what all of these theories describe is something none of us can actually recognize. They're not describing us. They're describing these weird abstractions, these abstra abstractions that no people really are. Is anybody really just a biological creature, really just an economic maximizer, really just a producer, really just a rational animal? No. Okay, all of these are one-dimensional, oversimplified visions of what humanity really is all about. So he says, we have to do something new. Philosophy answers to our need of forming a complete and unitary conception of the world and of life. Think about Sellers here, idea of getting those images together, of the world and of life. Those have to be brought together in the same image. And as a result, this <coughs> conception of feeling, which gives birth to an inward attitude and even to outward action. But the fact is that this feeling, instead of being a consequence of the conception, is the cause of it. In other words, he's saying, we tend to think about humanity and about politics and about whatever it is, whatever we think, on the basis mostly of our feelings, not really on the basis of rational arguments. Now, he doesn't think rational argument is completely powerless. He's, after all, writing a book. But he's saying, we are mostly emotional creatures. Rationality enters in. It has some role to play, but the fact is, emotion drives us underlying that. And indeed, we check our theories against our emotions. We say, does that feel right? Even in the most abstract philosophy seminar, we say, here's what the theory predicts. Does that make sense? And people will object to the theory based on their own intuitive emotional reactions. So he's saying it's the emotion that is really the most fundamental. Our philosophy, our mode of understanding or not understanding the world and life, springs from our feeling toward life itself. That's what's really fundamental, and really that has its roots in unconsciousness, in self the subconscious. We don't have any rational explanation for that. He's here going back to an attitude uh, expressed beautifully by Blaise Pascal in uh, Paul Sayers, in Thoughts, where he says, the heart has its reasons that reason knows not of. He's saying that's really our ultimate reasons for things. They come from the heart and not from the mind. And a philosophy or any attitude toward life has to recognize that. He says, man is said to be a reasoning animal. That's Aristotle's answer, what makes us distinct. He says, I don't know why he hasn't been defined as an effect, affective or feeling animal. Perhaps that which differentiates him from other animals is the feeling rather than the reason. More often have I seen a cat reason than laughing. And indeed, it's a good point. When have you seen an animal laugh? When have you seen an animal weep? But have you ever seen an animal think? Have you ever seen an animal solve a problem? Sure, that's not hard. Anybody who has a cat or a dog or anything has seen it solve a problem. Thinking is not difficult, but it's hard to explain feelings in the same way that a human being does. And so he says, in a philosopher, what must be most concern us is the man. Pay attention to the person, to the full account of life you find there, and not just to the dry words on the page. Well, that's going to include irrationality. He says, look, reason is built upon irrationality. What we think really depends on what we feel, in other words. And so in the end, he says, here's what matters. Man is not a means, not a means to some civilization, to some end product. All civilization addresses itself to man, to each man, to each other, not to some abstraction. But in the end, civilization and any theory has to answer to you, to you individually, and to each one of us, and has to make sense. The value is in us, not in some abstraction or political movement. Next time, we'll look at other reactions and see different sorts of responses to the same thing. Thank you.